Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Bassants. I'm the Visitor Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Thank you for attending veteran, uh, veteran Serving Veterans. Um, so most of our programming right now is online because of the pandemic, uh, but uh, the Missouri History Museum and Soldiers Memorial Military Museum are open Wednesday through Sunday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, with uh, safety precautions in place. We encourage you to make reservations in advance uh, at our website, mohistory.org, because we have reduced capacity right now. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the members of the Missouri Historical Society. If you're interested in supporting programs like this, I'll uh, put a link in the chat as soon as our speaker gets started uh, that you can follow. So I need to mention a few logistical details about today's program. Um, our upper time limit is about an hour. You shouldn't be here past 1 p.m. Uh, you can submit questions through the Q&A button on your toolbar. Uh, we'll do our best, but we might not have time to get to everybody's questions. Today's presentation is being recorded, so if you want to see it again or if you want to share it with anyone, it will be posted to the Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel in uh, probably within a few days. Your feedback is important to us. We'd appreciate it if you could answer a few questions for us after the program. A, uh, a, a survey should open in your browser uh, once the program ends, so keep an, op uh, an eye out for that when you close Zoom. So our speaker today is retired Air Force Major General Cassie Strom. She's going to tell us about her time in the service as well as her work uh, since retirement. Um, Cassie, take it away. Thank you, Jamie. I would like to um, see, let me just see if I get this done right. So thanks for having me on this. Um, I'm always proud to talk to people about the military service and particularly as a female veteran, um, because I think the military is just a great career path for women. So um, this gives me an opportunity to continue to plug that. I retired as a major general um, and really just flat out to the shock of probably most of the people I grew up with and luck being in the right place at the right time. I love my service, you know, and I can just start there. Um, this is a picture of me when I was getting my second star with my husband and daughter. And, you know, we all know that you can't get through any career, um, civilian or military without your family. And this is my family. Um, this was at my dad, he's in the center there. I don't know if you can, tell where he's at. He's right here. And he just turned 96 last week. Um, this is his 90th birthday celebration. He used to throw himself a birthday party every five years. But I'm one of seven children and my brothers and sisters and families are all in there as well as, as friends and family um, related to my parents and, and all. Um, this is really the starting point um, for all of our lives is the people that surround us. My mom, who died in 2001, which always chokes me up, um, was an amazing human being. And as kids, I don't know how many of you remember, I don't know what your ages are, but we used to have to go around the neighborhood and collect money for muscular dystrophy or cancer or those sorts of things. And that was back before you had all the social media and we would have these envelopes and we would have to knock on every door in our neighborhood. So um, I or one of my six brothers and sisters would do that as a regular basis as we were kids growing up. I always hated it because you know it was embarrassing as a child to go knock on all your neighbor's doors. But by the same token, when I look back on it now, um, it was a way our mom got us started on ensuring that we give, that we help, that we recognize that there are other people in the world that aren't as lucky as we are. Um, let me just make sure, sorry, I'm having trouble. So I had a really amazing career. I was a JAG, which is a judge advocate. We do legal work, both um, operational and sort of, you know, civic or civil type law. We do wills and powers of attorney to make sure everyone who's um, deploying um, has taken care of their family and loved ones. But we also do things like um, law of war briefings and preparation for deployments and 
and you know, working on the parameters of actually engaging and fighting a war. I spent my first uh, six years in the Air Force fairly traditional. Um, you know, I didn't join the Air Force or the military for all these sort of altruistic reasons that I know a lot of people have. I'm not a love it or leave it. I recognize that like each of us, um, our country, our militaries, all of our organizations have strengths and weaknesses. And I love um, helping and trying to make myself, the organizations I belong to and my community a better place for all the inhabitants. Um, I'm sure a lot of people could criticize me for that, but I, I've just always been fairly realistic. I don't know if that's in part from being female, the fourth out of seven children, you know, or, or what all influenced that, but that's just the perspective I come from. I joined the military because I love to travel. And then once I got in, I just, you know, it was an amazing experience. Um, within a year and a half of joining, I went over to Korea. From Korea, I went to Spain. And when I separated, I returned back to St. Louis and joined the Missouri National Guard. And it was really in the Missouri National Guard that I, I found myself in terms of a military career. And if you go back to you know, the beginnings of going around and collecting in the neighborhood, um, I was you know, being engaged in high school and college and different organizations. I got into nation building and it just had to do with the timing on when I served. And so um, in the guard, I spent most of my time either um, deploying to countries to help them build back their institutions um, and civil society or training other forces and working with the United Nations to um, train um, militaries around the world to participate in their exercises. Uh, many people don't know, but for a lot of countries, the United Nations um, pays so well that it really is a boon to be able to have militaries in certain countries. And um, some of the folks that deployed that we met from different countries would be able to retire after they had done and participated in a UN operation. Um, you know, we're a wealthy country. Um, we don't look at things quite the same way and we don't have quite the same issues. So this is, I, I always like this picture because there were four of us um, from the Air National Guard. Um, Tom, the one on the left was from the California Guard and um, Martin um, was from the DC Guard. There were four of us that deployed with Army Civil Affairs as Air National Guard um, personnel. We played with Army Civil Affairs to Bosnia and worked on various parts of the reconstruction. Um, so this was when we first landed in Kyrgyzstan and it's just a fun picture for me. Um, in Bosnia, you know, I, I, I like these pictures because they remind me um, of, really interesting times, um, but also, you know, a community of people, the Bosnians that are here in St. Louis, um, that have just added so much to our community. Um, and I've worked with them in a variety of capacities. But in Bosnia, when we landed, it was shocking because, you know, everything, everything was um, broken. And these are just some pictures from there. And, here I am um, walking across the Franz Josef Bridge, which you know we all know was the start of uh, World War II. Um, and so it's just interesting. It's interesting to travel around the world and see different places. Um, you know, Bosnia, when we had gotten there, I, I think it had just been like 10 years before they had the Olympics. And so these are up in the hills where the skiing and different events took place that now, you know, were barricaded. Um, we worked with uh, banking. We worked with um, settling claims um, for people. We worked on a whole variety of issues, again, to, you know, get them back functioning um, as as um, 
a country and having a civil society. When I first got there, I did two tours in Bosnia, one with the military and one where I was seconded um, by the State Department to the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. And um, the difference from the first visit and then coming back a year and a half later was just amazing. On our first visit, we were the second rotation in after signing Dayton. You could park on the sidewalk. You didn't have to follow street signs. This is what civil society means. Um, by the second visit, you would get ticketed. You know, so you could see by going back a year and a half later, you could really see the improvement and how a country had gotten back on track um, to you know, being a, a civilization ruled by laws and you know, having order to the way it conducts its business. These are the tunnels under the airport in Sarajevo. And, and I think you know, some of you may have been involved in, in I-4 and S-4, um, but it, this was the only way that food came in to um, the people of Sarajevo under the siege. And I said I did a lot of training of foreign forces. Um, here I am with, uh, I think we have, I know the one in the middle is a Marine next to me, but these are Kyrgyzstan forces. And again, we were training them to be um, able to participate in UN operations, which really brings a lot of funding and training and services and equipment and all to some of these foreign forces that don't have the same capability. Um, shockingly, I got to go and to the Pentagon and I was scared to death to go to the Pentagon. I don't know if there's anyone on the phone call that or on this um, Zoom that knows me, but I don't tend to keep my mouth shut and I tend to say what I think. And so I was very worried about getting deployed to work with the DOD general counsel's office that was helping run um, the civilian side of the the Iraqi war you know we were the ones because the State Department didn't take it we were the ones that were working with the government to um, develop and draft legislation and get it passed through their governing council so um, I lucked out which is why I'm not in uniform because I didn't have the ACUs but um, I lucked out because my boss the um, deputy general counsel could not go when they went to Iraq um, and so I got to fill in and go with our with the DOD general counsel. And this is at Babylon. I mean, the places I have gotten to see, um, the people I have met throughout the world, you know, it's just astounding. And it's it's to me the best part. That sort of you know short and sweet on my career. I spent um, you know a lot of years with the Missouri National Guard. In the end, I had, when I retired, I had 31 and a half years. Um, and along with that travel, I got to be engaged in a lot of volunteer activities as a result. I feel that as a major general retired from the Air Force and a female, I need to be sure that I get out there and am a presence so that young girls um, and parents of young girls and grandparents of young girls start seeing that this might be something that they want their themselves, you know, their children or their grandchildren to join in on. Um, that's very important to me. And I've had calls from women saying, oh, my granddaughter wants to join the military. I'm so scared. And I just, you know, tell them what a wonderful thing that is. Um, this was a real highlight. I was working with the city of St. Louis and got called to um, give an award to a gentleman that um, received it very late. And these are the Stalag 17B POW MIA survivors um, from that time in World War II. And they were having their last reunion in St. Louis, but it was virtually you know, unattended. And so we asked them to come back the following year and we would put on a proper celebration for them. And so um, this one also just tears me up because a lot of those people are no longer with us. But we got the people from Scott Air Force Base and the reserves and the guard and everybody participated and honored them. 
we had a opening down at the POWMIA Museum, which I know is not open, but we had a small opening. We had, um, you know, buses taking them all over town with escorts. Um, Patriot riders came in and, and took care of them. And then we had this dinner and celebrated what they had. Um, it was really, you know, it's really special. And um, they went out the way they should have with the recognition and um, support that they needed. So I talked about my, um, my personal family, the members of my family, but I also, you know, I have my guard family, I have my military family, and then I have my civilian job family. And this is Catholic Legal Assistance Ministry. Um, this is where I worked and started the Veterans Advocacy Project that really got me into doing things like that POWMIA ceremony. And these are an amazing group of people um, that I got to work with and all dedicated to helping people you know, that, that have not been as fortunate as we have been and to make sure that you know, their life goes a little more smoothly um, and is a little better for having had contact with us. I originally worked with CLAM, which is what Catholic Legal Assistance Ministry is, um, as, an, as an immigration advocate, and I worked with immigration issues, and that's where I got engaged with the Bosnian population, and having done two tours, I loved working with them and helping them get resettled here in St. Louis. And then later, after I had been deployed you know, and, and off for a couple of years, I came back and started the Veterans Advocacy. So um, I've worked mainly with veterans, but I've also worked with the community and through Catholic Legal Assistance Ministry, I got involved in the homeless shelter. And some of you may know Hens Forland. He's um, always, you know, retired army, Sergeant and boy, you, <laughs> you know, he's, he's an amazing human being, but he helped run that shelter and I would go and volunteer. I think that at times we forget how lucky we are because we are veterans for those of us that are. Because if I have a client or run into somebody that's a veteran, I know there is a whole slew of programs and services that I can get them hooked up to that will help them get their life better. That's not the same for all of our at-risk or lower income or people just having a tough year or two. Um, and the, the homeless shelter really made you realize that. To see families coming in with small children um, and trying to, you know, just stay warm at night. Um, you know, it, it's an eye opener to what our community has. I know we see the homeless downtown. Um, I found them to be amazing people. I worked with the shelter for a year or two and I always felt safe around them. You know, I, I, um, I really had a lot of respect for them. The other picture I have there with me in uniform, that's with my dad and that's George, who's a retired Marine. I like to throw him in because he's just an amazing human being with an amazing family. Um, he had ALS and, um, you know, we would go over there regularly and visit with him. And what the Marines did for him was also amazing. So some of the organizations I belong to, Again, you know, I feel in part because of being female and because of my rank that I need to not say no. Um, I think it's important to be out there and try and, um, you know, get other people involved with the military. This is a new organization that just started in 2019. This is the Missouri Veterans Hall of Fame. I don't know if you all have heard of it, but um, We'll be sending out information for our 2021 inductees and class of Hall of Fame. Um, we had four people inducted in our first Hall of Fame class and only one was surviving, still living now, which is Joseph Frank, who's a former national president of the American Legion, command, I mean, a former commander of the Na National American Legion, uh, commander of the state, you know, Department of Missouri's American Legion, and very engaged in um, 
fighting on behalf of injured and disabled veterans. Um, Harry Truman, Ophi, um, Ophi Landry Owens and Bryden Ross were our other inductees. And we had our ceremony down at the Capitol building. And obviously this was last October um, where we were all forced to keep separate and wear masks and that. Um, but this, you know, we want as the Missouri Veterans Hall of Fame, not only to honor our veterans, but we want to try and put together a traveling exhibit that can go around the state and educate our young people and our old people and our middle-aged people um, about the amazing people that come from the state of Missouri that, um, you know, that have served, served selflessly and just come back home and, you know, join back in with their families and work within their communities. And that's what our goal with the uh, with the Missouri Veterans Hall of Fame. I've also, you know, again, just been honored to participate in different programs at Soldiers Memorial. And this was where the French consul came in from Chicago to honor people um, from World War II that with the French Legion of Honor. This was an amazing ceremony, obviously before COVID. Um, but any of you who have not been to the Soldiers Memorial, the new um, reopened Soldiers Memorial. I, I definitely encourage you to get on their website, you know, check into their programs and tour um, the different exhibits that are there. Um, it really, it's such a beautiful building to start with. And then when you start looking at all the exhibits and the different artifacts and, and other things that they have there, um, it's just an eye opener. When my dad comes into town, um, I always look to see if there's some event that I can take him to there. You know, he's a World War II um, merchant marine um, and also it really is amazing. So this, um, I was the MC of it and I was very honored to participate in that program. And these individuals, you know, I forget to listen to people because I'm always go, 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 do this, do that. But if I force myself um, and remember to listen, just to hear what these folks have gone through, um, you know, and their families, uh, you learn so much. And that's for all the different areas that I've been involved in from the, uh, the Veterans Hall of Fame, from working with the homeless shelter to doing this. Um, it's just, we need to remember to listen. I think I've learned. Um, I'm also involved in the Gateway Community Veterans Engagement Board, and this is sort of an interface between veterans in our area and the VA. And we've done some different events. We've done a Storytellers X, which was really interesting as part of the story, you know, the Storytellers um, Festival that they do every year in St. Louis. Um, we have done a claim center where we tried to help people with on the spot claims. We've done a mental health symposium. We were in the planning for the veterans for putting on a veterans experience action center last summer, and then we had to cancel it. But it, it involves many people within our community, um, leaders of different organizations that come together and try and identify needs and gaps um, that we have in the greater St. Louis area. So that's been um, an interesting organization to be part of. Um, obviously all of them are hard with COVID. And recently, let's see, I think I have it. Recent, recently, um, so recently, and it's this picture here with the car, um, we received funds from the Bob Woodruff Foundation. So we received 2,500 this um, past fall. And then we've just received a, another um, grant from Bob Woodruff to help with food insecurity. So what we did um, with the 2,500 we received is that we, we um, got $25 gift certificates from Schnooks. And then we had a lot of, um, information and we put together resource bags and we distributed them at Jefferson Barracks 
um, food pantry, which is I think the third Saturday of every month down at, at Jefferson Barracks. And these were very well appreciated. And we're gonna be talking later today to see what we wanna do with the 10,000 that we've received for food insecurity. Um, it's amazing, you can always find people to help out. So that's the gateway. Um, I also work with the American Legion. Sorry, you do get you get involved pretty fast and easy. And I'm the department judge advocate for the American Legion. And I really hope if we have any veterans on the phone, on the Zoom call, um, that you participate in some kind of veteran service organization. It's amazing what these organizations do in terms of camaraderie and community and helping our youth and um, helping veterans, you know, get through the claim system and benefits and, and all those things. But it only is successful if we continue to get participation. Um, we need younger people involved in these organizations. And I do think they're vital um, in terms of taking care of all of us um, after separation. So this is Perryville, Missouri. I don't know if anyone's been down to Perryville, Missouri, but they're the ones that have the replica of the Vietnam Wall in terms of the way it's oriented on the hillside and size. It's an exact replica. Perryville also has an amazing, amazing veteran community that supports their people. The city of Perryville made October of, I think it was 2018, Women Veterans Month. And they put on a ceremony and honored their women veterans that were in their community. And I just was so impressed um, with what they did with this. And this was the evening dinner and talk and passing out the you know awards to them for being members of their community and having served. I've never seen any other community do that with women, um, and I was I was really thrilled um, to be able to participate in this. And it connected me up with a whole group of veterans down in the Perryville area, where we have the Stars and Stripes Museum, the Perry County Military History Museum, the Vietnam Wall. Um, you know, just, uh, there's just really a lot. It's worth a drive down there if, if you know, if you can. I'm missing a few more things that I like to do, but this is, this is where my heart is, is working with women veterans. Um, I'm like going to talk with those people at Perryville and listening to what those women are doing and what they've done in the service. Um, this is my love. And many of you, um, or some of you may have been involved in our Stand Up for Women Veterans. We found back in, I think it was 2009, that um, the women, the stand downs, you know, the Department of Labor and the county and the city ran, really didn't meet the needs of our women veterans. And we have a large women veteran population in this area. And so we decided to do a stand up for women veterans um, that mirrored the stand down and was more focused on things that our women veterans needed. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really fun. We had a lot of women veterans um, participate. We were able to do clothing giveaways, which weren't just military gear and boots, but women's clothing and children's clothing and clothing for you know, sons and daughters and spouses. Um, TSA, and I just throw this out, donates um, all their abandoned clothing to me um, and I get it all cleaned up and then it gets distributed either at our stand up or to the um, food pantry down at Jefferson Barracks. So it's amazing um, how many organizations now after TSA started doing this have joined in. I have our, um, my post 404 of the women's service post and it's auxiliary, um, con you know, contribute clothing and um, do a whole variety of things. Um, as we get further down the photos, I'll show you the, the picture with the car. They have knitted caps and scarves for veterans and we gave them out in front of Soldiers Memorial and then I gave them out again at the pantry 
Um, and people were, were really pleased and the kids would come by. It was so fun in the car. And, you know, it was, what color do you like? And, you know, and you could try and match up to what they wanted and they got, you know, a feeling that they got to choose as opposed to being handed out things. And, and it was great. But our stand-up now um, has ceased being a, an event with a variety of services. And now we just get together on Veterans Day when the city has its parade. And we do do giveaways and we do have people there to talk about different resources. And we have a clothing giveaway. And then we march and that's our stand-up for women veterans. And um, we have so much fun doing that. Um, and we had to miss it this year, but we did do a bit of a clothes giveaway because as you can imagine, um, with a year of no events, I had a lot of clothes that were piled up in my basement. You'd think I'd get that. So again, this is the old one where we really had an involved, um, we had it at St. Louis University's um, Student Center and that's our post 404 uh, color guard. And these are some of the women and kids, you know, you can't have, you can't have women getting together without having um, childcare and an ability to take care of the kids and the women from Scott that came over and helped us. Um, it was just a, you know, they were always really fun events. And this is an idea of some of the clothing we give away, you know, it, 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 We've had jewelry before, we've had lingerie, we have, you know, things that women need. And like I say, they're the best group, you know, I just love them. So, you know, we help each other, we talk to each other, we're there for each other, and, um, and we have a lot of fun when we do this. So, um, this is our clothes giveaway that we did this Veterans Day. Um, we did it the Saturday right before Veterans Day, I believe, and we spaced out the tables and we had all our people um, wear masks and we had plastic masks and, and of course we're not going to have the same turnout with this kind of time frame, but um, but we still were able to help women. And then after the women had gone through, we let the homeless people that were down in the area or people that were wandering come and and also pick out clothing. Um, you know, the goal was just to get to, you know, get the, the clothing and the items distributed to people that needed them. And I think, I think that's just about it. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. I'm always happy to talk to people and, um, try and figure out ways to get them help. So thank you to, to Soldiers Memorial for letting me talk and, and hopefully it was of some interest. Thanks, Cassie. Um, we don't have any audience questions yet, so I'll start with one of my own. Um, in looking nationally at different uh, organizations that serve women veterans, there's kind of kind of the same needs seem to come up uh, a lot. Uh, child care, housing, and uh, health seem to be big ones. And health surprised me uh, because veterans get VA benefits. Um, so I guess my question is, you, you talked as well about uh, how about the gap between what Stan Down was able to do and the needs of some women veterans. So my question is, what do you think it would take uh, for these organizations and events that are meant to to meet the needs of veterans to to really meet the needs of of women veterans as well? Well, for starters, they need to make sure that they have women on their planning teams and women that you know are aware of the issues for vets. Um, Sometimes I think we get sort of stovepipe in the way we do things. And so we don't think out of the box. You know, initially when we did our stand-ups, um, you know, while a stand down has barbers, they don't have people to help cut women's hair. And no woman's gonna go to a barber, you know, unless they're very, very, very desperate. Um, we had people to do their nails too. So you just have to think, um, you know, and expand things out. Um, you know, not all women wanna wear military boots and, um, you know, there are lots of organizations that you can get, um, you can get 
um, things from like Heroes Care, you know, like TSA does, like my auxiliary women, um, you know, helping out. So you just have to to um, rethink things and just look a little more broadly and make sure you have participation of women, you know, in the planning. Makes sense. Another question I had was uh, about something that I think is interesting about your story is how the the spirit of uh, wanting to help and wanting to to make things better in in some kind of a way um, is kind of a through line through your military service and and your service after retiring. And um, you told the story of uh, fundraising for uh, for medical needs. Who who was that organized? Was that through your school? I'm, you lost me. I don't remember saying that on fundraising for medical. Oh, so uh, you, you were talking about when you were a kid. Um, oh, no. Actually, you know, now we get like those labels in the mail and they, they send you the labels and they give you and they want you to give back a donation. When I was a child, those came in. You didn't have labels. You had packages that would come out to somebody in the neighborhood that had volunteered and we would go around and collect money for those those organizations. Um, okay. you know, so it's sort of the the old style getting the labels or the calendars or the those things, you know, and I doubt many people remember it, but um, you know, that's what we used to do to fund, you know, Cancer Society, you know, MDS, you know, all those different things that now we just get in the mail. I see. It was okay. much more personal in a way. So uh, for my own part, um, my high school had a uh, community service requirement to graduate. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, the, you know, what they were trying to teach with that really just rolled off my back. Uh, I saw it as a requirement. I didn't really kind of understand what you were saying about, uh, about giving back. And so are, are you are you able to say uh, where that um, where that conviction or that energy comes from for you? Was was that instilled uh, by your parents? Uh, you know, I'm not completely sure. I'm sure it was instilled by my parents and the people that surround me. I also was incredibly fortunate with the family I grew up in and the life I had. You know, I didn't have. I mean, I, had, I was housed and fed and educated with, you know, six brothers and sisters. We weren't wealthy, but we had, you know, my mom really focused on education. I think she's the one that sort of did that. When I was in high school and college, she'd say, you know, Cassie's never met a cause she didn't like, you know, and it was sort of like a standing joke. Anything that came around, I always jumped on it. So I'm, I'm sure I got it from my family and particularly my mom. My final question, uh, we don't have any from the audience yet. Uh, my final question would uh, be about how the pandemic has impacted uh, some of the services, uh, especially for homeless people. Um, I know you, uh, you were able to put on the, uh, able to, dist to distribute the clothes outside of Soldiers Memorial, um, but are, are there any kinds of services that are more difficult to provide or uh, how has that been disrupted? This past I think, year. I mean, the VA is getting back on track, but I think almost all services have been disrupted. And um, for, you know, for a lot of our veterans that have also maybe mental health issues, just the lack of contact, um, I think is probably the biggest impact on our physical and mental well-being, because we really do need interaction with people. I have some clients and I know when they're going downhill, I just say to them, who are you talking to? Are you getting out? Are you going to church or whatever organization or thing that they're involved in? Um, because we really do need that one-on-one -on -one personal um, contact with people. And we have a lot of people that are out on their own. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's impacting everyone <laughs> right now. Well, if we don't have any audience questions, we'll probably call it there. We'll just give it a give it a few seconds to see whether anyone has any questions. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll promote our upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, a uh, representative from Greenwood Cemetery is going to be uh, telling us about 
uh, St. Louisans who are alive uh, around uh, Emancipation Day. Uh, so that should be interesting. That's organized by Sha Shakia Gillette, uh, the head of the African American History Initiative. Uh, and then the 28th of this month, 6.30 p.m., we have another Soldiers Memorial Program. Author Jack Seiko is going to uh, talk about his book, Where the Birds Never Sing. Uh, it talks about uh, the battalion that his father served in and the liberation of Dachau that they participated in. Um, so that should be that should be interesting. That's in uh, honor of um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. We have a question uh, from Joselyn, a women veteran. Uh, I served in the army for three and a half years. I was wondering how we get involved with the women veterans organization. Is there a website? There's not, but I have an email. If um, I don't know how she can share her email with me and I'll get her on my list. I send out announcements um, for events and activities or things that I think are interest to a group of women vets. So um, I can give my email verbally or do you know of a better way, Jamie? Uh, chat might be good because then that's persistent. If you just okay. make sure that it's uh, addressed to all panelists and attendees, I think it's panelists yeah, only see. by default. Um, okay. All right. And, you know, one thing I forgot to add, the next thing I want to work on that I have women vets um, interested in is having people at participate and attend with women going to the VA for medical care or others, because we have a lot of women who have suffered MTS or MST and have other issues. And so they're not able to represent themselves as well. And I think it compromises their care. Um, so that's something we want to work on. That may be something Jocelyn's interested in too. All right. I think that went to everybody. Oh, yes, that's uh, that's showing up as a reply to her question. Wonderful. Okay, did it go to everyone though, or just to her? I actually can't tell from my screen. All right. <laughs> Maybe someone can let us know as a question in the Q&A. Um, I'll just give it a, another few seconds for questions. Thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate you telling your story and, and letting us know about some of the resources that are available. Um, as I mentioned in the opening, there will be an online survey that will open when you close out the Zoom seminar. Um, I've let you know already about the programs that we have coming up. We'll um, see everybody in the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you.